Greetings and welcome to the second lesson in the STEM career program. The first lesson we talked about the history of chemical warfare and why it's important and why there are actually careers out there that will um, be dedicated to the detection and per detection and protection of chemical agents. Today we're going to talk about the chemical agents themselves. So let's get started. We're going to go over six different types of chemical agents. The first type is riot control. Riot control agents are non-lethal and they're used to control crowds. And we'll get into more detail on these things in a moment. The second type of chemical agent is incapacitating agents. They are also lethal. And what the point of incapacitating agents are, are to render individuals unable to perform their duties. While the third type of agent is uh, choking agents are often referred to as pulmonary agents. Uh, choking agents are lethal. Um, inhalation causes a buildup of fluids in the lungs and it's this, this buildup of fluid in your lungs will basically make you drowned um, and since you're on land they call it dry land drowning with choking agents. The fourth type is blister agents. These cause severe chemical burns resulting in water blisters. The fifth is blood agents. Uh, blood agents prevent the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between cells. And then the last one we're gonna talk about is nerve agents. Nerve agents prevent muscle control and we'll get into how that works um, as well too. So let's first talk about those riot control agents. There's a few different types of riot control agents that you're probably familiar with, and the first one is pepper spray. Uh, pepper spray is abbreviated with a capital O, capital C. That's the abbreviation for pepper spray. And it is um, what makes pepper spray um, potent with the, the active in, uh, ingredient in it, if you would, is uh, cap capsaicin. Capsaicin is the molecule that's um, illustrated right here. And this is what makes, it's actually the molecule that's in chili peppers that makes peppers hot. Um, when exposed, um, you'll feel a burning sensation and it usually will last for a couple hours even after you're not exposed to this. It's just probably the easiest chemi chemical agent to make on your own if you just get a hot pepper and grind it up, you'll have that capsaicin in there and put mix it with some oil so it's um, it's viscous and uh, you got pepper spray. Now I highly uh, advise that you don't get that near your own eyes because it'll be burning. So um, anyways, that would be pepper spray. The next type of chemical agent that's for riot control is tear gas. And you probably thought about that right off the bat when we talked about riot control agents is tear gas. Uh, tear gas irritates mucous membranes in the eyes, nose, mouth, and lungs. It causes um, coughing, um, tearing, sneezing. This wears off faster than pepper spray, usually about 15 minutes. Uh, the picture we have over here is chloroacetophenon and it's abbreviated with a capital CN. This is um, something that you can buy. Um, we often refer to it as mace. There are other types of pepper um, riot control agents that are stronger, they're more powerful. They're, the, 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 what should I say? The symptoms are stronger. It's gonna burn more. It's gonna be more uncomfortable. And this is CS and CR. Uh, they also dissipate faster. Uh, this is something that the military and the police are more likely to use. Um, CN won't be as painful situation and this is something you can buy and keep on you and you know as, as for protection where the CS and CR will probably be more painful but also goes away quicker um, and that, that makes more sense because you know we want we don't want to be issuing out things to people that can just get over the counter that's going to cause a lot of pain to people and the military and police are going to want to get people to disperse as fast as possible so I've got a very cool video um, about this stuff. When I was in the Navy, I was exposed, and, and if you've been in the military, you've been exposed to tear gas. It's part of boot camp, but as a chemical warfare specialist, I was um, uh, got exposed to it even more so in school. But that's nothing compared to what the recon get, uh, the force recon gets exposed to during their training. And we'll take a look at that right here. The raid goes down fast, but this mission is far from over. Move your casualties! Get them off the X! Go, go, go. 
Marines never leave their dead or wounded on the battlefield. 200-pound dummies stand in for the fallen, and some Marines are designated as wounded. It's only three miles back to base, but there's one massive hurdle in their way. Gas. Oh, here we go. Here we go. We better start moving or we're gonna hurt back. You take a breath in and it just like burns you inside your lungs. And you start coughing hysterically. And the more you breathe in, the more you start coughing. Skin is irritated, your eyes are burning, your chest and your lungs, if you take a deep breath of it, it becomes unbearable to a certain extent. In short order, the death march earns its name. It's a rite of passage every recon marine must endure. Let's go, nobody gives a Let's get through this. But there's no perspective for the marines caught in the crippling fog. Get the the instinct to quit overwhelms every man. Hey, get the up! Get up! It's pure survival and chaos. That way, go! The easy things become much more difficult, and the difficult things become seemingly impossible. Pick your body up! Pick him up! Let's go! What the f It'll definitely induce panic and stress, similar to being in a really good ambush and about to overrun. If someone cannot function with the CS, I mean they're told they can't help carry a stretcher, they can't carry their own rifle, they can't pretty much pretty much gotta walk them through it. Keep walking. Come on, you got it! The combined weight of a rucksack and a dummy is 270 pounds. Uphill in the tear gas, every step is bone crushing. Every inch of ground earned. Yes! Go! Ah! Hey, get it up! Get it up! Get it up! Yeah, keep moving! Go! What's the s? Get up! Pick it up! Hey, Ken, you're f bad, baby! Pick the body up! This ain't f. I can't see. I can't see. You say you can't. You can't. Ah! I can't believe that you can. Pick the rock. The gas is terrible. Chill the f out. You need to get it together. Eventually, if guys realize, hey, you can move through this and breathe through it and carry somebody through it. Come on! Get through it! Yeah, yeah! It just comes back to the mental toughness thing and the limits that you have to exceed. So um, that's the Marines. That's some hardcore exposure to tear gas. And if you notice, that gas that they were exposed to was the CS. That's the more potent one, the more painful one. It dissipates quicker, but it is more painful to be exposed to. So that's pretty crazy. All right, the next type of um, agent we're going to talk about is incapacitating agents. Uh, following World War II, the U.S. military investigated a wide range of possible non-lethal psychobehavioral agents. And I don't know what the purpose of it, but for me, just analyzing this idea, I think it, I think it very wise to use incapacitating agents in that when you do use chemicals in warfare, it's going to affect everything around there, and there's going to be collateral damage. You know, you're going to hit civilians, you're going to hit uh, targets that you don't want to hit. With an incapacitating agent, the idea was when you do this, it incapacitates your enemy, you can subdue them, and if there's any collateral damage, if there's any civilians or friendly fire around there, they're not killed by it. So the idea seems to me, at least personally, that's my own view on it, is, is very smart, and it's a really smart thing to do to investigate. Um, the investigation maybe didn't go as um, ethically as, as we, we might think could be, but let, let's talk about the different agents they decided to test. So they looked at using agents such as THC, LSD, PCP, and BZ. Many people probably have heard of three of them, at least the first three. THC is the, the chemical that's found in marijuana. Uh, that's the, the active drug in marijuana. So um, the idea here is if you could weaponize THC and spray that on an enemy, you'll be fighting against a bunch of stone people, which 
would be a lot easier than fighting against a lot of sharp, um, sharp, ready people. Uh, the second type of agent that they looked into was LSD. Um, LSD is very, very potent. You only need a, a just a, a fraction, just a micro droplet to give people um, the effects of LSD that will last eight to twelve hours. Extremely powerful drug. Um, and the, before they even weapon, they were trying to weaponize it and try to figure out the effects of using LSD in combat. They've used LSD for a lot of different things. They really, when this when this drug when this drug was uh, invented, they wanted to find some purpose for it. Um, it was used in psychiatry to um, try to unlock people's repressed feelings and emotions and stuff like that, kind of like dream therapy and stuff like that. Um, didn't really work out so well. The, they even looked at using LSD as a truth serum um, to to get people because you get uninhibited and, and start communicating. The problem was people were uninhibited and they would start communicating, but they may not be communicating anything that's real. You know, it could be fantasy, delusions, and stuff like that. So it wasn't very reliable. Um, but again, you put that on the enemy, and they're going to be hallucinating, tripping out, uh, have you know, seeing things that aren't there, and potentially. Um, you know, take them, take each other out. You know, you get paranoid. I, the worst thing you can imagine is someone on LSD that's got a gun and a grenade on them. I mean, that that's scary because they really are thinking in a total different world right there. Uh, PCP, that's referred to as angel dust. And um, the reason they inter introduced PCP was more of for your own troops. It was more of the idea, of, hey, when people are on PCP, they report that they feel super strong and they're just unstoppable. I had a friend in uh, the police, uh, LAPD, and he was um, detaining someone that was on PCP and they were on a free freeway overpass. And what happened, the guy uh, was on PCP, he didn't want to get arrested, and he jumped off the freeway overpass. To his amazement, he looked over the edge, the guy got up and ran away. He went down around, finally caught the guy. When they caught him, he had broken both legs. He was running on broken bones. With the PCP, he didn't feel the pain. He just had this feeling that he was invincible. Um, the thing is, he wasn't invincible. Um, he just would fight through the pain. Um, people that are exposed to LSD, or PCP, um, angel dust, they're, they're, they're not following orders very well. They can't think very straight. They're actually not moving very fast. They think they're doing such you know great kind of unstoppable but for your soldiers you want them to be sharp alert you don't want them making mistakes and a lot of mistakes will probably happen on PCP. BZ is the one that will give the most attention to with incapacitating agents here. BZ is also known as agent 15. Um, BZ can cause stupor which means that you're kind of just like in a way almost catatonic you're uh, when people if you're if you're kind of not answering questions and stuff like that your friends might say are you stupid i say friends because that should be a term of endearment to call someone stupid you should never do that when you mean that they're stupid but that means stupor it means that they're kind of just like glazed off in a space they're not not quite there almost catatonic um confusion people on bz feel confused uh, confab confabulation that means sh um, memory loss so after they've experienced bz they'll have this memory loss they'll experience illusions and hallucinations which can ingress uh, regress into phantom behavior such as plucking and disrobing so they'll think things that are there that aren't there they'll start pulling out their hair they'll start taking off their clothes um really quite strange there's a movie um, a lot of people don't realize called jacob's ladder and jacob's ladder it's a very interesting movie it's i think it's in the late 80s that it came out um and there's a guy in there and in the movie kind of flashes around it's kind of surreal and but it's based off of um bz the, uh, what he's going through and he's he's having like flashbacks um from when he was in war and um, sometimes in the movie he's with one family and then he's with another family. It's like you don't what, really know who his real wife is, what his real life is, what his real house is, and if his flashbacks are real or not. It's kind of flashbacks from this um, I, uh, the, the BZ. Um, so very powerful stuff here, this BZ. And the U.S. actually weaponized it in 1961. They weaponized BZ. And... Um, but it never actually saw operational use. So in Jacob's Ladder, this is a veteran from the Vietnam War, and during that time, BZ was weaponized. So the movie does ha did do some research on the on the symptoms and effects of BZ and the timing of it. So it is. Um, I, I like the movie, but you know, I like disturbing kind of things. So uh, if you like that kind of stuff, I suggest watch Jacob's Ladder. 
Um, so they never used operational use, and then they just the U.S. destroyed the stockpiles of BZ in 1988. So we don't we don't have that weaponized anymore. Um, you might think up to this point, like, well, you know what? People do drugs to act stupid and to forget and to be confused and to have illusions and hallucinations. How come I've heard of the other three, but I haven't heard of BZ? Why aren't people using BZ? Well, it's got some really bad aspects to BZ, really, really bad aspects. A lot of all drugs do, but so much so that this is not something people use recreationally. Um, and this is because BZ will cause severe cramping, uh, vomiting irrational fear and crying it's not really something that you want to do for fun on top of which it is much stronger than LSD remember LSD I said last eight to twelve hours BZ lasts two to three days so imagine this for two to three days um, horrible horrible so but you know as an agent to use against your enemy does have some um, strategic ideas so anyways, how did this uh, this all come about? How did we um, decide that we were going to use these different things? Or what did they test it on, I should say? Um, we're going to watch a really fascinating video about that. It's kind of old, so bear with me, but it's very informative, and it has actual footage of people being exposed to these different agents. So let's take a look at that. America's army of human guinea pigs and how they were used in secret drug experiments. For some, the nightmare never ends. I don't have a heart because of it. Because I can't touch my kids. And I can't tell my wife what I feel. Good evening. It's worth remembering that the Cold War had its price. The economies of both superpowers were skewed towards arms spending and the world is still feeling the after effects. But individuals too paid a price. In the race for arms superiority, chemical weapons were used on unsuspecting human guinea pigs. In the United States, not only did the army conduct these experiments, they also filmed them. Tonight, we show that uncensored film for the very first time, despite the Pentagon's attempts to withdraw it. It's an exclusive look at how the U.S. Army targeted its own people long before the enemy could. It's the story of a bad trip to Edgewood. I've served twice in Vietnam. I have never had anything that was so terrifying as that experience with the LSD. Never. I thought I was going crazy. But I didn't know what crazy was. It was that bad. I couldn't define crazy. But I knew that whatever this was, it was horrible. Ninety miles north of Washington, D.C. stands Edgewood Arsenal, Maryland. From World War I to the present day, it has been the center of the U.S. Army's research into chemical warfare. Within its laboratories, bizarre experiments took place. By giving a cat LSD, Edgewood Arsenal scientists could turn nature upside down. Animals were always tested before humans. Army scientists 
wanted to learn about the dose levels of nerve agents and chemical compounds. What would incapacitate and what would be lethal in an attack. And how their troops could defend themselves under attack. Goats were used as guinea pigs to test the efficiency of gas masks in a chemical explosion. But experiments were not confined to animals. James Ketchum, a retired army psychiatrist. At Edgewood, his job was to ensure that the bright young soldiers recruited from army bases across America were fit to be medical volunteers. Then he gave them chemical agents and measured their performance. I really don't think it would have been possible to develop this information without using human volunteers. Uh, you cannot generalize from the results in animals to the human. The human is generally much more sensitive to a given dose of a drug than any animal and uh, his ability to do so many things that animals can't do makes it impossible to predict the effects on that kind of behavior from animal work alone. They uh, came around one day and called a formation, you know, everybody kid in a group, and they started asking about who would like to go to Maryland to test new uh, gas masks, over-the-counter cough medicine stuff. And I was thinking about it, and I had been doing a lot of guard duty, KP duty, you know. And that was really sickening. Well, when they said three-day pass every weekend, no guard duty, no KP, and, and all you had to do was this, I just snatched my hand in the air and volunteered, you know. From my understanding of their presentation, I would be testing riot control gear, uh, stuff like tear gas, uh, riot control gases, and equipment. And uh, I was under, I had no idea that what actually happened to me would have been done to me while there. Some guys stuck their head in a, a sealed, uh, like a cubicle thing, and they sprayed gas in their face. Some, some guys uh, was operating tanks and stuff, and they sprayed it a cloud. They had to drive through the thing. The testing of humans lasted from 1955 to 1975. 7,000 soldiers were used as guinea pigs. Half were tested with psychochemicals, mind-altering drugs like atropine, scopolamine, and BZ. But the GIs were never told what kind of drugs they were being given or what effect they would have. When they came in to give me the injection, they told me they was going to give me this injection. I, uh, I questioned it. What is this for? You know? Well, I said, what's in that? What's in that? I want to know what's, what you're giving me. Don't ask questions. This is something that you're told to do. I said, well, what is this going to do to me? Because I was kind of apprehensive. I was getting scared at the time. I said, what are, you know, what are they giving me here? There's nothing wrong with me. I don't need any medication or anything. So, and I asked, well, what's, what's the purpose of this injection? You know, never mind. Don't say nothing. Just do what you're told. Just like that. That was all. Several weeks later, on a windy, bitter, cold day, the same volunteer ran the course again. This time, he received a small dose of a chemical compound just before he started his run. 
the chemical involved was PCP, better known today as the dangerous and illegal drug angel dust. He felt compelled to disobey his instructions not to touch the platform when he jumped. Although his vision was not impaired, he found it difficult to focus his attention on the next objective. His physical actions were noticeably slower. His motor coordination was disrupted because of the compound's effect. PCP gives the subject the delusion of unnatural strength. How do you feel? I feel pretty good, sir. Do you? Are you cold? Uh, no, I'm not cold at all. Are you tired? No, I'm not tired. Well, I could run. Could do some work, could you? Yes, sir. I could run. I run 100 miles right now. Is that right? That's pretty, right. Pretty kept up, huh? Uh-huh. I run through it. And now I feel good, and I'm not tired, and I can run through it again. You see what I mean? Yeah, pardon me for that. Uh, did Sergeant Discus give you any uh, instructions about what you were supposed to do tomorrow? Uh, Sergeant Discus? Uh, uh, yes. Let me see. What was I supposed to do tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow... What, is today Thursday? Today's Thursday, that's right. Today's Thursday, uh-huh. Well, tomorrow... Oh, oh. Wait a minute here. You lost some buttons, sir. I lost some buttons. Thousands of volunteers received doses of a secret compound called BZ. A small dose would lead to complete stupor for three days, followed by loss of memory. The army wanted to see how quickly different doses could incapacitate their fittest and most intelligent soldiers. And between 1955 and 1967, Edward Arsenal was responsible for testing 740 soldiers and 900 civilians with one of the most powerful drugs known to man, the hallucinogen LSD. People in my field were well aware that LSD was a potent drug, that it could cause deviant responses, that people could do uh, dangerous things to themselves and others, act impetuously and so forth. Um, and so we had to think about that a great deal. Um, I didn't want to do any studies with LSD until we had a secure environment. And when we had a secure environment, by which I mean a fully padded room, a nursing staff around the clock, and when we had developed screening to the point that we could, we thought, identify individuals who were at risk for having a psychotic response to LSD, uh, then we tentatively and cautiously began to give small doses. Two hours later, the squad, all except the drill sergeant, now drugged with LSD, again was ordered to fall in. The response was not the same. Notice the volunteer who salutes several times. Five minutes later, his severe depression caused the medical officers to end his participation in the test. But in marching, the drug squad, although starting fairly well, gave a sluggish and ragged performance. After a few minutes, the men found it difficult to obey orders. And soon, the results were chaotic. There was much laughter as the group attempted to give expression to inner emotions. This elation was group supported, and an individual who was separated from the group would show severe disturbance. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Volunteers were given doses of LSD between three and ten times higher than the normal acid trip. Army records show in one case a man received a dose 100 times higher. I, will, I laughed for, uh, seems like, hours on end. I laughed and laughed and laughed until I couldn't hold my hold my sides any longer. Uh, 
my sides were sore from laughter. It's like looking upwards and seeing spirals of glittering colors coming down, uh, unwinding, vivid colors, different colors, uh, colors that, that are, are really indescribable. I, I don't know, never seen colors like that. Subtract 7 from 98, please. 90, 91. All right, and continue. He's having a reaction that's a little different from the ordinary, where most of the effects are bodily sensations. And in fact, he made the comment, uh, I feel incapacitated. I think he must have been reading the brochure or something in advance. But uh, this was a librarian and a very intelligent guy. And uh... So um, you can see this, this video. And I think one of the things that strikes a lot of people when they watch this, they're like, you know, they tested it on our own people, 7,000 U.S. soldiers, and they didn't even know what they were getting exposed to. If you think about it from a scientific standpoint, about the things that we've learned about science and how you do conduct experiments, you have to control as many variables as you can. So if you tell a subject that you're going to be given a certain drug, a stimulant, a depressant, a hallucinogen, they are prone to probably start to think that they might feel if you're telling them to give them a stimulant the placebo effect because you're you're some you're, you're giving them that idea they might feel a little more energized if you tell them it's a depressant they might feel a little more relaxed if they say, say it's a uh, hallucinogen they might say oh I think I saw something so you can't you couldn't they couldn't tell these guys what they were being given these things were really strong though and I imagine people with adverse effects in today's day and age probably are um, beneficiaries of very large lawsuits um, for our government because I know being injured uh, while you're in the military you get disability so being injured in this fashion um, I'm sure that they're taken care of I don't know if that compensates well enough for what they had to go through um, but that's what it is and, um, and and this is a good example of this individual where he says I feel incapacitated with it being given an incapacitating agent and the scientist even uh, the doctor said you know like I, I think he might have read the brochure before he came in it seems a little bit too much exactly what he's been given that he kind of knew about so that's what I mean about the placebo effect all right um, the next agent incapacitating agent is um, Colocol, Colocol 1. It was developed in uh, the USSR and the Soviet Union in the 1970s. And it has, this is a real thing. You see in the cartoons and comic books and stuff like that, there's something called, you know, tear gas, like Batman comes flying in there and he throws the tear, um, the knockout gas, knockout gas is what I meant, throws the knockout gas in the room and everybody's sleeping and he, you know, he goes in and does his thing. And you might think, well, that's just stuff that comic books are about. No, actually, comic books got this idea from the real thing. There is something knockout gas. Um, there's only one documented case I could find of Colocol being used um, and this is a video clip of it, of that situation here. Um, when you watch it try to think to yourself why was it only used once and I think the ant we'll talk about that in a moment when this is over. So let's take a look at this video here. Мы пришли в столицу России, чтобы остановить войну или умереть здесь, ради Аллах. Нам нет разницы, где умирать. Мы погибнем здесь, унося с собой сотни жизней и катеров. Клянусь Аллахом, мы стремимся умереть больше, чем вы хотите жить. Аллаху Акбар. Хорошо хоть раз перевернуться и на опасном вираже. On a drizzly Wednesday night in October, 
Several hundred people were watching a musical at a ball-bearing factory theater in Moscow. The show, Nordost, is a romantic love story set in Stalin's Russia. Контракте. Мы вчетвером ходили, потому что, ну, как бы, был такой еще момент, дети даже думали, может быть, уйти, потому что все как-то грустно, и какое-то такое настроение. Мы решили остаться на второй день. It was a fateful decision. As the audience settled down to the second half of the show, dozens of heavily armed men and women, laden with explosives, arrived at the theater in three vans. The attackers raked the foyer with gunfire and swarmed into the building. Inside the auditorium, the theater goers were watching the show and heard nothing. That night's performance was recorded, as was usual, by the theater's video camera. Такой замысел. Сейчас очень модно. Потом, значит, пошли со стороны фойе люди, вот эти буфетчицы, гардеробщицы, они вот идут. И я говорю, как хорошо играет, то есть вот страх в лице. И потом, то когда они сели все, вот это был предпоследний ряд перед нами, я поняла, что это не игра. As gunmen sealed off the auditorium, the sound on the video was cut. The audience heard the terrorist leader, Mofsa Baraev, announce that if the Russian army did not get out of Chechnya, he would command his followers to blow up the theater and everyone inside it. By now, the police had sealed off the surrounding streets. From inside the theater, a hostage used her mobile phone to call the local radio station. Татьяна, скажите, пожалуйста, а сейчас есть рядом с вами кто-то из террористов? Да, у нас тут девушки, девушки все в взрывчатках. Алло. Алло, здравствуйте. Здравствуйте, да. Это тоже заложник. Малейшая попытка штурма, взрыв будет моментальный, обязательный. Ведь эти родители, которых мы любим, единственная возможность остаться нам в живых, это единственная возможность. Мы все взлетим на воздух. Если наше правительство в ближайшее время э, примет решение о выводе войск из Чечни и заявит об этом в ближайшее, э, начнут переговоры и объявят об этом. The Thursday morning, the same gunman switched on his camera again. The suicide squad numbered 22 men and 19 women. The women's job was to guard the hostages and, on command, to detonate the explosives strapped to their bodies. Нам показывали чеченки свои вот эти пластиковые бомбы, которые были у них всех на животах. Им достаточно было соединить два провода, что делалось в течение секунды. И если хотя бы одна из них это сделала бы, то есть детонировали бы все бомбы, которые находились в этом помещении. It was clear from the start that the Kremlin, humiliated by such a bold attack, would never give in to the Chechens' demands. 
Relatives and friends prayed for the hostages to be saved, but everyone expected a bloodbath. Говорили они нам, в общем-то, одно с самого начала. Они нам сказали, что все равно штурм будет, все равно мы все умрем. Вот и даже не надейтесь, что вы отсюда выйдете живыми. Мы приехали сюда умирать, и вы умрете вместе с нами. Штурм это то, чего мы боялись больше всего. И нам казалось, что если именно таково будет решение правительства, таково действие правительства, попытаться освободить нас штурмом, то все мы погибнем. Какая-то тишина звенящая. Тишина, мы все лежим. Потом начал вокруг меня нарастать храп. Вот этот нарастающий храп, это такой, такая лавина, такой сгусток храпа. Он со всех сторон начал нарастать, нарастать. Вот прям вот по, как, будто, как будто по команде. И вот весь зал захрапел. Вот прям громко так. As the hostages slept, the Chechen gunmen volleyed sporadically into the silence. And still, the Russians waited. If even a single Chechen widow stayed conscious as they stormed the building, there would be no survivors. Now, as the Alpha troops stood poised for the final onslaught, They saw something that made their hearts sink. A hostage, fully conscious after more than 20 minutes in the gas-filled auditorium. If she was still awake, how many others were too? The theater's assistant choreographer, Galina, was one of a handful of hostages on whom the knockout gas had little effect. Приподнялась и стала всех ребят вокруг себя расталкивать. Я их дубасила по щекам, щипала их за нос, таскала за волосы, пыталась их пробудить, потому что я боялась, что они во сне умрут. Galina managed to wake just one of the teenage actors but she collapsed before she could get out of the auditorium. The boy actor made it to the foyer. He and three other groggy hostages were led to safety. At long last, the Russians went in. First floor storeroom, Arayev and his deputies made a brief last stand. Зал заполнился людьми, и они начали крепко материться, и русская речь, и я поняла, что все замечательно, нас освобождают. But there weren't enough stretchers or doctors. Sleeping hostages, already fighting for breath, were carried out with their heads, rolled back and laid face up in the rain. Dozens simply choked on their own vomit or swallowed their tongues. 
There were plenty of antidotes to the gas, but too few medics to give the jabs. Hostages died in their seats, on the front steps of the theater, on the floors of the city buses which were sent to ferry them to hospital. 129 hostages perished in the bungled aftermath, and the Russians' miraculous victory turned to dust. So it's a very interesting video that brings up a, a, a good thought-provoking kind of situation here is um, using the Colocol, the knockout gas in this situation, every terrorist died, no officers died in the process, and um, most of the hostages got out alive. Now the problem is um, agencies, governments, whatnot, we don't want the blood on our hands. None of the people died because of the terrorists killing them. They all died because the Russians deployed this gas. And so they don't use it anymore because if you use an anesthesia without proper supervision, you know, you knock somebody out, when you get your tooth pulled or something like that and you get knocked out, there's people there watching you. They've got, you know, um, uh, I don't know what it's called, a tube in your mouth to make sure that you can breathe, that it doesn't obstruct your airway. There's people watching your vitals and monitoring you. If you just knock out a whole bunch of people and no one's taking care of you, your tongue can slide back in your neck. You could, you can't clear your throat. There's all kinds of things that can happen. So they don't, you know, countries don't want that on their hands. The fact that this collateral damage occurred and it was their fault that these people died. But let's think about this logically. If they didn't use this, those terrorists were going to blow up the whole place. Everybody was going to die in there. There would have been no survivors. So, but the difference is the terrorists would have killed those people, not the Russians. It, so it, it is. Um, I think it, it has a lot of potential uses. Um, I hope it's still around. I hope people would consider using it in, in some point or another. I think this was a success, a great success, but that's my opinion. Um, I know how the media and, and other people could look at this as a great failure. Uh, it's understandable, but um, you know those people that they're interviewing there would, in this event, you saw that those interviews, they wouldn't be around um, had they tried it any other way that I could think of, at least. I'm sure there's a better way or another way, but um, you know it's it's pretty pretty interesting. All right, so now we're going to go into the the lethal agents. Um, again, Colocol wasn't meant to be lethal, but it, it can be if unsupervised. Those are incapacitating. So we're going to talk about the lethal agents here. The first one being choking agents. Uh, choking agents, um, the first example is chlorine gas. That was the first massively used chemical agent in warfare back in World War I. Um, and then later they started to um, kind of work on this structure to make things um, more potent. In other words, a sm uh, more damaging in its smaller dosages. So we've got chloropipsarin, we've got diphosgene, and then phosgene. These guys were developed to actually be more potent than just the chlorine gas. Um, as you know, chlorine gas is a diatomic element, meaning it always comes in pairs. So chlorine is just Cl2. It's commonly used in manufacturing to kill bacteria in pools and in drinking water. Chlorine is um, single-handedly the reason we live much longer today. I shouldn't say single-handedly, but a huge, huge aspect on why we live longer today because of this. Because we're not drinking things that have pathogens in it. We're not bathing or, or, or swimming in things that have these pathogens in it. And it's probably doubled the life of humans. Chlorine is also being used in medicines. Um, it's very reactive, and so we can use it to do good things for ourselves in high concentrations. It'll also kill us. So chlorine is a active, reactive kind of agent, and that's the that's the point of this here. Phosgene 
um, is the probably the most common dangerous choking agent that is around. This is the most commonly uh, of the, of the dangerous ones. Phosgene is colorless, so there, if there's a if it's dispersed, you're not going to get as much of a warning of it. Um, it's 3.5 times greater density than air, so it's going to sit down. It's not going to dissipate very easily because it's going to it's going to sit down on the ground, um, go into the trenches. Um, it smells like musty hay at four parts per million. So um, what, what, what the reason that's kind of brought up is if you're in an environment where you're afraid that they're going to be exposed to chemical agents, there's certain things that will give you smells of indicators that like a warning you yell gas to your, your um, allies, your, your partners, and everyone gets their gas masks on. Um, so you get a, these different scents um, are important in identifying them. How choking agents work, in, in particular phosgene, is it attaches to pro proteins in your pulmonary alveoli. That's basically the capillaries in your lung. Uh, very, very thin tissue there, and it's where the hemoglobin, your red blood cells, are able to release carbon dioxide and take in an oxygen and move around. Um, it, so it disrupts those proteins, so you can't this uh, this transfer doesn't happen uh, very well or effectively. I should say very well because it, it does take a while to die. It sounds like a horrible, horrible death, but when you get exposed to phosgene, you die usually within 24 to 48 hours. And I would imagine that's going to be something like 24 to 48 hours of um, slow suffocation. I, I just, I, it just, just sounds extremely, extremely rough to me. Phosgene is created by reacting carbon monoxide and chlorine gas, and that's what makes the phosgene. So this is phosgene here, it's a carbon monoxide. And, and chlorine gas re reacted with it. And carbon monoxide itself is a um, um, very dangerous molecule. Carbon monoxide has a higher affinity to your hemoglobin in your red blood cells than that does of oxygen. And this might give you an idea of why, you know, the kind of the chemical properties of phosgene. Um, what, what I mean by with carbon monoxide itself is if you're inhaling some gases into your lungs, if there's carbon monoxide and oxygen, the carbon monoxide is more likely to attach to the red blood cells than the oxygen does, meaning it's not delivering oxygen to your tissue. And as we already learned, chlorine is a choking agent. You put these two bad boys together and you get phosgene. Not so nice. Next type of agents are blister agents. And blister agents were developed by the Germans in World War I um, after they, they introduced um, chlorine and then everybody was throwing chlorine at each other then it developed into phosgene um, the Germans said you know what people are starting to put in uh, they're starting to wear gas masks and now all these chemical weapons are being basically uh, they're not being very effective because people are putting on these gas masks so they developed blister agents and what the blister agents would do is yeah you got your face covered but now any skin that's going to be available you're going to get chemical burns on there so these are called vesicants, blister agents. It's a substance that causes um, tissue blistering. That's that's what uh, blister agents are. Uh, blister agents are denser than air, so it's gonna again, it's gonna sit down low. It's not going to be floating up into the atmosphere, and they're re readily absorbed through the skin. Examples of blister agents include mustard gas, which can be sulfur or nitrogen based. And what's interesting about mustard gas is if you get exposed to it, it the, the effects of the blister agent will delay for about four to six hours. So if you're walking along and the blister agent is, the mustard gas is like on the vegetation and stuff like that, and you're walking through the forest and it's rubbing across your body, you don't even realize that you got the blister agent on you, which has strategic purposes if you think about setting up traps because nobody knows and the, everybody's walking through and then four to six hours later, you get extreme burning and you start getting blisters formed and they don't know where you picked it up. As opposed to if it was instant, if the first person that goes across it is going to feel this burn and go, hey, there's something here, kind of quarantine off that area, less people will get affected. Um, so it does have that advantage of being delayed like that where lewisite is a blister agent that has that immediate effect. The, str the strategy for using something like that would be you want these people to get out of there quickly. You want to lay down something um, and prevent them from moving forward and they feel that and they're getting, so it's basically like a, an immediate obvious block where the mustard gas would be kind of a subtle trap, if you would, uh, strategically on when you would use which ones. Phosgene oxime is not actually, that's another 
commonly used blister agent, but technically it's not really a blister agent because it does not actually cause blisters. It causes chemical burns, so they call that a nettle agent, but we're going to group it in with the blister agents for our all intents and purposes. Um, but that's another example of these guys. These cause these bad chemical burns. So if you take a look at the structure of this, um, sulfur mustard is, these are, remember, carbons. So you've got a, carb, a chlorine connected to a carbon. Remember, carbon's got four valence electrons, so it's going to make four connections. So this carbon's connected to another carbon here. Since it only has two, we assume that there's two hydrogens on here because it always makes four. So there'll be a hydrogen, hydrogen. We don't illustrate that because it just makes the diagrams kind of messy. This is a skeletal diagram. So we've got a carbon here. Carbon here would have two hydrogens connected to a sulfur. So we've got just a little string of carbons out with chlorines, and we know that chlorine's highly reactive, and a sulfur in the middle. That's sulfur mustard. And nitrogen is very similar. It's the same kind of setup here. We have two carbons, but nitrogen's in the center with the chlorines. The only difference is we have a methyl group or one carbon um, coming out of that nitrogen here, and they both act very similar. So here is a quick little video about blister agents, and it's kind of nice that it's a bit grainy because being exposed to blister agents, um, not a pretty sight. Contact with, including eyes, skin, lungs, and the stomach. Mustard is the most commonly used blister agent. It is employed as a liquid, but evaporates slowly to form a vapor or gas. It presents a long-term contact and vapor hazard. While blister agents containing arsenic produce immediate pain upon contact, there will be little or no pain at the time of contact with mustard. In fact, symptoms of mustard are usually delayed from four to six hours. Blisters may take weeks to heal, and hospitalization is required in more severe cases. Blister agents can enter through your eyes, nose, or mouth. If they do, the symptoms are coughing, labored breathing, stomach pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or temporary blindness. Severe exposure can result in permanent blindness. Okay, let's move on. The next type of agent we're going to talk about are blood agents, and these include cyanide and arsenic-based. These are naturally found in small amounts in the environment and in cigarettes. Um, remember, we talk about the dose makes the poison, and I think that's important. Not that I advocate smoking cigarettes. I don't smoke, never have smoked cigarette, um, but there, there is arsenic and cyanide in cigarettes, but the dosage is low in that it's not going to it's not going to kill you. Um, I think smoking itself, anything that you're, you're damaging your lungs, you're causing rapid healing of the alveoli or a lot of damage. And as the, as you have to regenerate things, there's more likelihood of, of uh, damage there. Um, but there's also arsenic and apple seeds. Um, it's all over the place. It's really about the dosage of it that makes it um, a blood agent that actually kills you. So um, I know that's a bit confusing. It sounds like I'm saying it's okay to smoke, but I'm not saying that at whatsoever. But I sometimes think they talk about ingredients and things and over scare people into into uh, making you know making the decisions. And and I would like to I would like to scare you into not smoking, but um, I would also like you to be critical thinkers and understand what's going on here. So, anyways, I completely confused everybody on that. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, cyanide is released when synthetic fabrics or plastics burn. So if there's a house fire uh, and there's things burning, it's the smoke that's going to kill you quickly. So you will get a blood agent in you if, if your house is burning because those synthetic uh, materials in your house, the, the plastics that are burning, will be producing this cyanide gas. And that is what a blood agent is. You take a, a, a whiff or two of that and you're, you're dead. I mean, it, it acts pretty quick, and, you, and it, there's not a lot of time you have with blood agents. So of the blood agents, we're going to talk about two different, um, of, of the cyanide-based blood agents, we're going to talk about two different types, and that's cyanogen chloride and hydrogen cyanide, CK and AC. When exposed to these blood agents, um, it will cause your um, eye and respiratory irritation, and there will be a faint um, almond odor that soldiers, airmen, um, people in this situation that could be exposed to it will be alert for. So if they smell that almond odor, they know quickly to get those gas masks on. Why so fast? Blood agents are the reason you really want to get gas masks on quickly is because it can cause rapid death in seconds. In fact, cyanide blood agents are what they use in the gas chamber um, to do what we call humane executions of people. 
Um, how blood agents work is it makes changes in the tertiary structure of the trans, um, transport protein in the mitochondrial membrane. So the mitochondrial membrane is where you're you're generating energy for your cells. If you guys remember a little bit of flashback from biology, in your cells you got the mitochondria and that's what we call the powerhouse of the cell. And so by damaging, and to get things in and out of a cell membrane, we have these proteins that allow transportation back and forth and hopefully uh, you remember that from your biology class. So what blood agents do is they damage that protein and so therefore you got this oxygenated blood and it can't get into the mitochondria. and um, and so you can't you can't get in the mitochondria and and it can't um, it, it just doesn't work so your blood fills up um, with oxygen but your cells can't access that oxygen and that's what causes the death um, victims that are of cyanide based agents will have a very bright 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 red blood because they will be heavily oxygenated their blood will be very very oxygenated it's just their cells can't access that oxygen um, Cyanide based agents um, damage gas masks quickly, damage the filters. So mask filters are either ineffective or saturated quickly and need to be replaced when cyanide based agents are um, what's exposed. When I was in the Navy, we would often remember these cyanide agents based off this one here, or this CK, we'd call it canister cracker. If there was um, CK or um, a cyanide, based agent that we, that we were exposed to, our policy, our criteria was to immediately change out your filter because your filter is now going to be pretty much destroyed. Um, they act quickly, they also dissipate quickly, and in the process they will ruin your filters quickly too. So cyanide, if you guys remember your polyatomic anions, cyanide is carbon nitrogen negative. So it's CN negative, it's a polyatomic anion. So this is the cyanide right here, right here. And this it's attached to a chlorine, or you could have your cyanide right here attached to a hydrogen. That's the only difference, but that's the cyanide, the CN, triple bond. You also have arsenic-based blood agents or arsenine-based blood agents. These do not cause irritation, so they're not going to give you that warning, and they have a faint garlic order. If you've watched the first video in our lesson um, and you saw the video about Fallujah, about the Saddam Hussein um, putting all those chemicals on the Kurds, uh, one of the survivors stated that you know it smelled like garlic. Um, that would mean, by his statement there, that he was exposed to an arsenine-based blood agent. And, you know, what kills one person doesn't kill everybody. He obviously had a, 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 a higher tolerance than other people because if you can actually smell the garlic, this is only detectable at greater than fatal concentrations. So, um, you know, he's very lucky to have smelled that and be survived. I say that loosely because um, he was talking about all of his friends and family that passed away, so I don't know how lucky he really is. It's very, very sad um, what happened there. Anyways, um, what the arsenine blood um, agents do is they damage red blood cells. So instead of damaging the mitochondria, they damage the actual red blood cells, making them unable to deliver the oxygen throughout your body. Which are chemicals that prevent the body from using oxygen. Blood agents enter the body by being inhaled. Blood agents may produce symptoms within a few seconds. The agents may stimulate breathing so strongly that some casualties will be unable to hold their breath very long. Symptoms are headache, dizziness, and a pink skin color. Some blood agents may cause intense irritation of eyes, nose, and throat. Typically, when blood agents are encountered, death occurs rapidly or recovery takes place within a few minutes. Particularly with blood agents, it is critical to get your protective mask on as soon as possible. For soldiers who do not mask quickly, medical attention and treatment are required as soon as possible. So, um, yeah, so what's blood agents, um, they'll either kill you quickly or, they'll, or you'll recover quickly. It's, it's, a, it's kind of an all or nothing situation there. Very, very scary on how quick blood agents work. The last type of agent we're going to talk about um, in this second one is 
second lesson is nerve agents and a um, little history about nerve agents in 1991 um, they were classified as weapons of mass destruction by the UN resolution 687 in 1993 chemical weapons Con um, convention the CWC outlawed the stockpiling of nerve agents and in 1997 um, chem the chemical weapons convention law took effect so it takes a while for some of these things to take effect sometimes or all the time um, so how do nerve agents work we're going to talk about that right now this is going back into uh, chemistry and biology so we're talking uh, the blend of chemistry and biology that, by the way is called physiology um, we're going to talk about a molecule that your body naturally pr produces called acetylcholine and what acetylcholine does is it's what allows your muscles to contract so the biological effects of nerve agent, how it works, is it inhibits the acetylcholesterol, <laughs> acetylcholesterase, which is the enzyme that destroys acetylcholine. So let's, I think it works best by explaining this with this picture here. In a normal reaction, when your brain or when your nerves tell a muscle to constrict, what, that, what happens is those nerves release a chemical across the synapses to your muscle. And as this chemical goes across to the synapses, uh, it locks in, your muscle will con, 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 um, con, con, bleh, constrict, contract, contract. Anyways, um, and to relax, you'll have this um, acetylcholesterase which will destroy the acetylcholine, breaking it apart, and that will allow your muscle to relax. What nerve agents do is it inhibits the ability to destroy the acetylcholine. So what will happen is your muscle will contract and it will stay contracted. It can't ever relax because it, you don't have that enzyme that breaks apart the molecule here. So that's how um, nerve agents work. Initial symptoms of nerve agents are runny nose, tightness of the chest, and the one that we talk about most often when we're look, detecting nerve agents is pinpointed pupils. And if you understand what we just talked about, that the acetylcholase is not going to be released, um, one uh, muscle you have that's very, very sensitive is your eyes, the iris of your eyes. And so what will happen is that will constrict and it won't be able to relax. And so you'll get this pinpointed eyes. Now this is the initial symptoms for a small dosage because your whole body isn't really locking up right yet, but your eyes will probably do this um, a little bit quicker than anything else. Severe sy symptoms of nerve agents include loss of bodily functions. So you will involuntarily start to drool um, salivate. Uh, lacrimate means that you will involuntarily start to cry. Um, you will start to involuntarily start to urinate, defecate, vomit. This is just going to be a mess. All of your fluids are going to be flying all over the place. You can't control anything here. Um, death comes from respiratory depression. So how nerve agents kill you is the diaphragm um, it is, is a muscle that makes your um, lungs uh, get smaller and larger. It pushes against your lungs. And what happens is your diaphragm constricts and it can't relax. So therefore, you can't let air into your lungs. It, it, your lungs are still there. There's still, they're still the opening. It's just that you don't have a muscle that's pushing air in and out of your lungs anymore. So you die of uh, basically suffocation. Ooh, sounds horrible, doesn't it? Self-aid measures must be taken immediately. Follow the proper procedures and administer the antidote from your nerve agent antidote kit. This man, stunned by a nearby round, has failed to put on his mask. He is in serious trouble. He is being exposed to nerve agent through his eyes, nose, and mouth. The adverse reactions are almost immediate. Already his nose is running and saliva is flowing freely. The pupils of his eyes are constricting, blurring his vision, and making it difficult for him to see, even in daylight. At night, he would be unable to see at all. His chest is tight, and he's having difficulty breathing. These are the first symptoms of exposure to nerve agents. More serious exposure will cause nausea and vomiting, with strong muscular twitching as the nerve agent interrupts the normal triggering of muscle action by the nervous system. There may be uncontrolled shaking of the body as the nerve agent interferes with normal brain functions causing convulsions. The victim loses consciousness as brain activity is depressed. Finally, unable to relax and rest, the muscles contract permanently, then fatigue and weaken. 
The heart rate, initially increased as the nerve agent attacked, now slows severely, and the victim dies. That does not sound pleasant, but I really did appreciate his acting skills. In fact, um, in one class I had a student ask if that was real, that they, they really filmed the guy dying of nerve agent. I think I think he's really poorly acted, but um, it, it fooled some people. What are you going to do? Anyways, um, there's different types of nerve agents. The first type, um, the first ones that were developed, were developed by the Germans, and so they get the first letter as a G. Um, this means that it was it was uh, this 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 was synthesized by the Germans, the G class nerve agents. They are non persistent, which means they disseminate quickly. Um, you know, the effects of it it doesn't stay around long. That's what non persistent means. Uh, they were discovered during or right after World War II by Dr. Shader, and examples of uh, G class nerve agents are Tabun. Sarin. Sarin is a popular one. This is the one that we talked about the on Shiriko in the first lesson, the on Shiriko cult. They use sarin, and this is the structure of sarin right here. Um, um, Soman and cyclosarin. So these are different types of G type agents. They are, um, again, non persistent. And of the nerve agents, these are the, of, believe it or not, these are the least hazardous. And uh, one drop of sarin uh, that, you, in your, that you breathe in. Um, will probably kill you so and this is the least uh, dangerous of them all it's pretty scary stuff the next type of nerve agent are the V type nerve agents um, these are Amaton that were developed by the British scientist this is referred to as Amaton which was um, developed by British scientist Dr. Um, uh, Hosh or gosh 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 uh, gosh I can't pronounce his name to tell you the truth I don't know Anyways, they are viscous, meaning they are sticky, like syrup. They so, and that makes them stay around. So when you put a V-type agent on the battlefield, um, it gets on the plants and it stays around there. Um, this is, um, well, basically what I said. They they don't degrade quickly or wash away easily. V-type agents are ten times more toxic than G-type agents. They include Amaton, which is VG. VX, which is the more popular one that I hear about a lot when I was in the Navy and we talked about training. There's VE, VM, and VR. This is the structure of VX um, nerve agent. Uh, one drop of this on your skin can kill you in 15 minutes. So it doesn't have to be inhaled. This can just get on your skin and kill you. Within seconds of exposure, symptoms of nausea and convulsions take over. Without emergency treatment, Paralysis, respiratory failure, and death can occur within minutes. This deadly killer is the nerve agent VX. Weapon VX. Classification organophosphate. Lethal dose 30 micrograms. The organophosphate type of chemicals are considered nerve agents because they attack the nervous system. The nervous system controls all of the functions of the body and so by interrupting or stimulating that you get all these various effects. VX in its normal state is a tasteless odorless liquid that can be absorbed through the skin in seconds. When heated it turns into a lingering vapor that if inhaled is even more deadly. VX is a persistent agent which means it's less volatile than the other nerve agents. This means that uh, when it's exposed to the air uh, the material doesn't go up into the air and it lasts much longer. To give you an idea of how toxic the chemical is, if you pulled a penny out of your pocket and if you looked at the penny and you looked at Lincoln's eye, it only takes a drop size of Lincoln's eye to cause lethality. There are no confirmed cases of VX being used on people. But it's widely believed that during Saddam Hussein's chemical attack against the Kurds in 1988, VX was dispersed with deadly results. The attack on the Kurds killed over 5,000. VX is the most potent nerve agent today, but the path to its discovery dates back to before World War I. Chemists knew 
that many of the chemicals used in the dye industry and other uh, industries could be very deadly. During World War I, the Germans began to weaponize chemicals by putting them in artillery shells and portable chemical cylinders and releasing them on the battlefield. And they used them very effectively. Although chemical agents were effective in causing casualties, they were not always lethal. But that would change in the 1930s, when German scientists created the first nerve agent named Tabun. Between 1942 and 1945, they produced 12,000 tons of Tabun, as well as several thousand variations, including sarin. The nerve agents were definitely unique compared to the earlier World War I chemical warfare agents. They had very little smell to them. They began affecting the person very quickly and were much more lethal. When Germany fell to the Allies in 1945, its chemical stockpile was seized, and the United States began producing its own variation of the German nerve agents, which became classified as G agents. The most widely produced was a far more lethal version of sarin nerve gas. But by the early 1950s, an even deadlier nerve agent was discovered. The British company was investigating some insecticides and came across a particularly potent one. They looked at it and then referred it to the United States in about 1953-54 time frame. And the United States looked at it and realized that it was a whole new series of very potent nerve agents that had been discovered. They looked at all of them and then decided that probably VX was the one that they would like to go with. From 1961 to 1968, the United States produced approximately 4,400 tons of VX, enough to kill every human being on the planet. The U.S. stockpile served as a deterrent against the Soviet Union, which had begun producing even larger supplies of chemical agents, including the nerve agents Soman, Sarin, and VX. In 1961, we standardized a uh, artillery projectile and we came up with a newly designed landmine and also loaded the X in a rocket warhead. Fortunately, neither country ever used a lethal nerve agent against the other. In 1969, Richard Nixon agreed to ban the U.S. manufacturing of chemical weapons. Production of VX ceased and the stockpile was placed in storage. Today, only the United States and Russia claim to have stockpiles of VX. Yet some suspect that Iraq may have produced large quantities of the deadly nerve agent. At the onset of Operation Iraqi Freedom, U.S. forces prepared for the worst. We felt that it was very likely that uh, our adversaries would use chemical weapons against us, and we felt that they had VX in their arsenal. VX is often used as a terrain denial weapon, kind of the way you would use landmines. And one of the things we're very concerned about is not having our forces stumble into land that's been contaminated with VX. The main goal at Edgewood Chemical and Biological Center in Maryland is to provide protection and detection for the U.S. troops in Iraq. We have the best protected force in the world. And each warfighter has all the protective equipment that he or she needs, the protective clothing and, and the protective mask. The masks will totally protect you against uh, inhaling VX. And the chemical protective clothing is specially designed so that the VX can't penetrate it. In January of 2005, the United States ended its hunt for weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. No VX was found. But the threat of VX doesn't end in Iraq. Other countries are suspected to be attempting to produce the deadly agent. And there is enough VX in the U.S. and Russian stockpiles to kill millions. So the threat of attack from one of the world's deadliest weapons remains. The most effective antidote to VX is a mixture of drugs that includes atropine, 
prolidoxine chloride, and diazepam. Auto-injector kits containing these drugs are given to U.S. soldiers in case... So we'll get into these um, antidotes in, in case... In a moment, we'll talk about those. Now, one thing, um, when I was doing my research about nerve agents, I came across was an agent called Novocoque agents. Um, so we talked about the G agents, the V agents got stronger. There is a third generation of, of um, nerve agents that I don't know a lot about. They didn't talk to me about it much when I was in the Navy, actually at all. I kind of stumbled across, uh, across this as I was doing my own research for my own presentation. Um, let me just take a look at something real quick my own presentation yeah so um, this would be considered the third generation the Novocoque agents of nerve agents Novocoque agents are undetectable by NATO detection equipment at least when I did my research here there is no way of detecting the Novocoque agents which is scary because we have detectors for um, indicators for the V agents and the G agents but there's nothing that detects the Novocoque agents Novocoque agents also bypass chemical protective gear. Your gas mask won't protect you against this one. Um, these are known as substance 33. Um, in their, this, I'll start with A, uh, 230 to about 262. Um, this is the example of Novocoque 232. Quite scary. If we take a look at comparison of the nerve agents, if we look here, um, let's just talk about the different ones. So sarin is a, a G agent. Um, so let's take a look at that. Minimal, uh, minimal exposure can take uh, 5 to 12 hours to act. Inhalation of only 1,000 micrograms per um, 1 cubic meter uh, will cause death within one minute. We're, um, Salmon like sarin but acts faster minimal exposure will take 40 seconds to 10 minutes to act where minimal exposure here can take 5 to 12 minimal exposure can take um, a minute to 10 minutes basically for this one to kick in cycloserin another g type agent is twice as toxic as sarin that's gb inhalation of 30 micrograms um, per one cubic meter can cause death in only one minute so you see here we have 100 micrograms um, here we're down to 30. So what, what they do is they try to make things have more, the, the dose, a smaller dose to be more potential um, dangerous to you. VX agent, and that was the one that, that we talked to, that talked a lot about in that last video, it's 10 times more toxic than sarin. Um, only 10 micrograms on the skin will kill a person. So this doesn't have to be inhaled, this just gets on the skin. And finally, the Novocox, the third generation of nerve agents. These are 100 times more toxic than sarin. So it's 10 times more um, powerful than VX. Um, quite, quite scary. In 12 minutes, the rabbit displaying advanced symptoms is removed from the cage, placed on the table, and the back is decontaminated with household bleach or Clorox. Two Pam chloride and atropine mixed are injected into the ear vein. Silver nitrate is applied to stop the bleeding. Returned to the cage, the rabbit is observed. Convulsions continue, but step by step we notice the slow but sure recovery of muscular control and breathing becomes easier. However, sporadic convulsions continue. Here we are seeing the effects of combined atropine and oxime treatment proving to be far more effective than atropine alone. This combination gives the soldier a much better chance for survival in a nerve agent attack.
when I was uh, in the Navy, you, you get these um, shots, this, this uh, atropine and 2-pam chloride, you get, the, the, it's a shot, and it self-injects when you, um, it's, it's, it's a tube, and when you press down on it, the needle actually shoots out on its own, so you don't have the needle to actually hurt you. Um, it's not going to poke you, but when you press down really hard, the needle shoots out, and then it self-injects, it just takes everything out. So what, um, what you do is you hit people in the thigh with it. If they're showing the signs of nerve agents, you bam, you hit, you hit them in the thigh, and it injects this in there. And then what you're supposed to do, at least when I was in, is you put that um, the the atropine two pound chloride. You put it, you actually take the needle and you stick it on their their uniform, so people can look and if they come come by, they can see how many times they've been injected with the antidote, so you don't overdose them on the antidotes itself. Um, but they are rather effective, and this is something that's issued to all the soldiers um, and sailors and airmen um, if you are in an environment where this could be a situation that you're going to be involved in. So that concludes our discussion on different types of agents, and we've got one more discussion about some protective gear and how that works, and that will be the third lesson on this. So I will talk to you guys soon.